Hello, and welcome to Tech Talk Community Conversations, the quarterly broadcast from Dr. Jill Bowen, Commissioner of the City of Philadelphia, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, in which we explore the work DBHIDS and our partners do together to address the key components of tech, which stands for trauma, equity, and community. So now let's learn about tech. Dr. Bowen. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello and welcome to Tech Talk Community Conversation, the video series in which we explore how the work we do at DBHIDS and with our community providers, partners, aligns to address trauma, achieve equity, and engage community. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Reginald Banks. Dr. Banks is the chair of the Coalition of Culturally Competent Providers and the chief psychologist at Dunbar Community Counseling Services. He has been helping to serve the people of Philadelphia for more than 30 years. Dr. Banks, why don't you tell us a little about your work here and how it aligns with the priorities to address trauma, achieve equity, and engage community? Dr. Banks? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Bourne, for having me here today. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it to my office today, so that you might hear a little bit of background noise and possibly a little bit of music. Um, but, um, but with that said, uh, Dunbar Community Counseling Services is uh, the agency that I represent and, and have been affiliated with for the last 15 years. And as you indicated, I am a, the chair of the Coalition of Culturally Competent Providers um, uh, and recently became uh, in that position, but started that, uh, that uh, organization. Uh, but both of these organizations uh, have evolved uh, to really address uh, our community around uh, the basic tenets of tech. Uh, and, and as a result of that, when we look at uh, systems, overall systems, whether it uh, relates to how we operate today, uh, how we have to transform uh, the operations that we have today, especially in uh, today's climate that have, you know, we're, we're, ta we're talking pre-pandemic and, and then we're talking, you know, now in, with the pandemic here. Uh, one of the things that we realized that we have to do immediately is to address these traumatic issues that are beset our community, especially as it relates to violence, uh, equity, uh, uh, as it relates to engaging the community in ways that we haven't traditionally uh, done so. Now, of course, when we think about mental health and mental wellness services, we, we have been standalone clinics in the community, and many of these organizations have been around for 20, 30 years or so, and some of us have been 10 and 15 years, but we had a very set uh, traditional way of providing services, and it usually centered around coming to this entity, this box of a place that we call wellness, uh, and if the client couldn't get there, then they missed services and what have you. Um, today, we, we have, we're in a new environment where, you know, we have to leave our clinics. We have to not only provide mental health services, we're now realizing that we have to do a little bit of everything, pretty much like the, today's modern teacher. We're social workers, we're advocates, we are you know, resource finders or coordinators. Um, and in addition to that, we're, we're looking for housing because our families have more needs than just mental health service needs. We, they have you know, a, a whole host of issues that we have now determined uh, and called social determinants. So our goal now is to, to not be a clinic. Our goal is to be a part of the community in a, in a resource wellness center that happens to do some clinical work. I think that that's um, one of the best ways I have ever heard it described. Um, that's exactly right. So here we are, um, you know, sort of traditionally trained to do um, clinical work in a bricks and mortar site. Um, and what we know and what has been heightened um, through the pandemic has been all of the multiple layers of trauma and the um, the impacts that, you know, on the, on wellness. Um, and to be able to do treatment, it's, a, it's impossible to do successful treatment without addressing the social drivers. And perhaps in many ways, that was always the case, but it's certainly heightened now and, and critical now. So can you say more about the ways in which um, the shifting to understanding that treatment has to include 
um, all of the components of wellness, that it has to include these social determinants and drivers really of health and wellness. And, and why that, that addressing that trauma um, actually advances um, equity and why it's so critical to do it uh, through the way you describe through, with, in, amongst the community. Right. So I, I look at it this way. I mean, this, this, you are absolutely right. Um, uh, well, let me, before I answer that, I just definitely want to thank you personally, because I, I mentioned in a meeting publicly that you are the most important person in the city of Philadelphia because you are taking on something in a, in a, in a crisis and you're, you're, you're essentially uh, helping to build uh, the team that addresses this crisis that was un we, no, no, no one could have prepared for it, but you're doing an excellent job at it and, and, and engaging with tech. This is the, this is the hallmark of how we are rebranding our business uh, and how we are uh, understanding that we are no longer just clinics anymore. We, we have to be on the on the ground with the community. And guess what, Jill? There, the community is is welcoming us. Uh, they want us. They it, you wouldn't understand how important it is for us to be outside the clinic on on uh, in North Philadelphia, speaking with community based organizations such as Fatherhoods Fatherhoods on a Mission, uh, and doing bi weekly groups out in the community. Uh, now with these community-based organizations. So these are community-based organizations who have been able to secure funding to do these groups in the community. They're open. Uh, they have uh, counselors attached to it. Uh, and then they have uh, providers like us as adjunct partners, where if someone is, is, is they're dealing with, the, for instance, the, the person who may have just lost a loved one. Uh, and they know many times who, who, uh, who harmed their loved ones and, and sometimes taken their lives. And so they've had to deal with the, the possibility of responding in a way that is, is similar to what happened to their loved one, while at the same time seeking help to address the traumatic responses of, of, of anxiety and anger, of depression. Now, listen, these serious things don't go away. It's just that how they may engage around seeking mental health services uh, is, is different. And so what it looks like is they go to the CBO people who are on the ground, know what's happening in the community first, and then those people ultimately refer them to us so that we can get them supportive services that are more formalized. And as you would imagine with trauma, there's an evidence-based practice approach to that. Now, trauma in itself is more of a theoretical approach to treatment than it, uh, it is not as theory-based as, as uh, CBT is. But our first introduction to many of these community members being associated with community-based organizations allows them to trust what we're doing, to, for them to access services, and then for us to begin the, 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 the mode of treatment and, and, and helping them on the road to recovery. I, I exactly um, right and agree with you. Um, you know, when you, uh, when you speak in this way about how the folks who have been experiencing these intensive traumas reach out to a community-based organization or connect up. There is a trust there. There is, you know, that the, that they can um, engage in a way that um, is not necessarily about a traditional mental health, but is absolutely um, looking for um, healing in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we, to embrace that is exactly right. And I, I really appreciate the approach from both a community uh, view that you're, you're sharing with us, as well as from like the psychological perspective, like you are able to marry it in a way that the, the field needs so, um, really needs so badly because that's where uh, the hurt is. And that's where the the healing is right there in the community. And so for us to, as a system, sit outside that 
um, is just not anywhere near good enough, and we're never going to um, move the needle on equity if we continue to sit um, there, as opposed to join in where the the um, where the healing is even beginning and also um, you know uh, working. Right, right, and I'll I'll add to that, Jill, that um, when we engage in this way. With, with community-based organizations and, you know, you know, what we find is those organizations have a right from a uh, achieving equity standpoint of view to exist, to, to expand their, their reach in ways that we can't, um, which is not, you know, that's not our charge is to be on the ground in that way, in a sustained way. But it is our charge to partner with them to 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 bring in the therapeutic approach to treatment and add their kids and their their loved ones and uh, because the healing part is where we specialize and um, we want these organizations to have the adequate amount of funding to bring in real persons with li real life experiences. Um, we want that support to be there for them, not only to, to address their, their uh, uh, wellness needs, but many of those individuals to address their needs, their wellness needs have now become advocates to try to prevent violence and to usher uh, young men who, who traditionally would not uh, come into services, trying to get them to participate. Now, of course, you know, the model that, that you engage with on the street is different because it has to be open. It has to be flexible there. Uh, and many times there has to be a point person where people can feel safe calling that person in the, on, on a moment's notice. Now, you know, if you look at our system, you, you have to come in at a certain time. You, you have to build at that certain time. You have a location code, you know, none of that stuff is what the reality is for the person in need. So because we can't do that part, what we can do is be the expertise part around wellness. And guess what? We get to learn from, from them around how to reach people uh, and, and these, these traumatic experiences to, to be as a support. And now we're the co-facilitator of healing. And it's exciting because it empowers the people to be in charge of how they want to receive treatment and get help. Uh, and to achieve equity and address trauma, and, and they're defining it. And guess what, Jill? Additionally, there's no one way to do this. We we just go with where they're taking the, the community leaders and advocates are taking us, and it's organic. And you can't put it in a book and and prescribe it. It it, it you just have to be a part of it and activate it through your participation. And and in this way, consistency is the intervention. It is our evidence-based practice. And, and in other words, to reverse that, it would be our practice-based evidence because we're on the ground and, and supporting them. And, and our presence is, is, it gives them hope and helps them to get closer to the standardized form of treatment that maybe only six or seven sessions may work before they, they go back out you know, into, the, into their lives. But at least they they have one step, two steps closer to understanding uh, what it is that we do, and it and it also helps that I'm a brother. Is this is a rare, <laughs> you know, there are not a lot of brothers in the field, uh, mm -hmm. and we hope to encourage uh, many community members that as they go through this experience and realize that they have been impacted, but they can also be counselors and, and help in the healing profession that also we want them to consider coming into the profession. Now, unfortunately, we don't, you know, we, we wish that they would not have had these experiences, but many of them are finding that they are natural to be people who are, are coming into this field to help other people. Yeah, I, and from an equity perspective, there are not enough counselors, um, black and brown counselors, you know, period. And yeah. um, anything that we can do that encourages people to think about um, being in this field. Uh, so going even more upstream with it uh, in terms of internships and um, opportunities when uh, people are in high school and college or, you know, even uh, 
in their early careers makes makes a real difference. And I think uh, a lot of what I'm hearing from you, uh, in addition to the consistency and the partnering and the connection and the um, you know practice uh, based evidence and um, the wisdom of the community, is the value that you are clearly placing on that kind of community connectedness, value as healing, value as you know to many to much degree the the antidote to the disconnectedness and the disengagement, um, the disenfranchisement of so many um, of so many folks today, um, and how how incredible that is for you to be there. Um, and, and by even being present, you're saying that you value the work that um, that they're doing and being and partnering. So this has to be a systemic change. It has to be a model. Um, and I really, really appreciate just the clarity with which you, you know, explain and describe what what your organization is doing, what you're doing, and the the perception. And where do you think you, you and your um, team would take it, um, take this model in the, you know, throughout the, the year, where do you think we, we may be, uh, and in many ways, you are a leader in this work, um, yeah. and people are paying attention to what, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Well, well, one thing we have to do, um, and, and that we, what we plan to do in the next year is we, we have, um, Three basic goals, and sometimes you you have goals that are really too long. I I, I try to <laughs> convince my 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 therapist to make sure that the treatment plans are short, sweet, to the point, and understandable to the client and to anyone reading it. So I'm going to be really straightforward with our goals. One, you know, we want to increase, continue to increase our partnerships with community-based organizations, trade organizations. Obviously, I'm part of that. But we also, through those means, we we want to uh, fashion a message to our policymakers. And and as you know, we were part of a, a mayoral forum this morning. But we have to make sure that we we have uh, our questions uh, centered around how funding uh, is is going to look like in the future and how it's going to come into the city. Now, we just spoke about community-based organizations, and, and right now, these organizations are receiving a lion's share of prevention and violence dollars, and, and we want that to happen. But we don't want it to be mixed up where we don't have those same dollars or similar dollars coming in to organizations who actually do the work. And so in that way, we, we want to make sure that this is not, because it's a hot topic, violence, mental health, well, we have long traditional organizations who do that work. Now, of course, we're we're redefining how we do it. We're not going to be in the box called a clinic and 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 wait for the client to come to us anymore. Now we are going to be out in the community and we're going to partner with the community-based organizations and we're going to try to develop some some partnership and equity there so that we we don't move too far going to the left with the CBOs and, and leave out the providers. So we want to make sure that in the partnership fashion that we're we're making sure that these policy developers understand that the, the importance of that. And that would mean to make sure that the dollars are there for the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities and CBH. The other piece is, is what we call staffing, and that's the retention recruitment piece. That That is a piece that we, we want to highlight uh, in our organization. And, you know, the shortage in our organization is around the therapist component. And I think that, you know, there's a variety of issues and, and you know, challenges there. But, you know, the, the longstanding one is that historically that our profession has not been on parity with the pay for the position. So at this point, those individuals who are licensed have more uh, leeway in where they're going to choose to take their talents. And unfortunately, you know, you got large corporations as a result of the pandemic have scaled up to recruit those individuals and to, to bring them on telehealth platforms and, and challenge the industry as, as we know it. So we're going to have to have our policy makers address that equity with re that parity with regards to what it is that we pay our, our, our individuals. And guess what? It aligns with what the city policy is around trying to make sure that everyone has a decent wage for living. 
Uh, and and, and it, it, now it's going to challenge some of the organizations because we're going to have to change our budgets so that we can increase pay to our line staff. And, 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 and it, we'll just have to do that. That makes sense because it feeds into the social determinants. I mean, all of this stuff laid out when, it's, when we connect the dots, we are all for the same thing but we're gonna to have to have policy pushers and makers and decision makers at you know, DBH and CBH that you guys uh, continue to push this message and make us accountable and connect with the community-based organization. So, you know, and that way that means we have to retool and redefine what it is that we do. The last piece is, is the healing circles. And when we say healing circles, we're talking about making sure that not only are we looking to partner with the community-based organizations who do this work and try to get young men and women into their, their programs to provide therapy. But the agencies that ourselves, we, we have to heal our staff. We're doing a lot of work around what it means to have a mental health uh, staff uh, today. So, you know, we, we had to redefine, one, their, their, their pay, uh, we have to redefine their roles and give them more responsibilities um, and give them a clear path to promotion. Uh, historically, we have not done that. We, so we're going to have to fix that, and we're doing that really well. And in addition to that, we're, we're, we have to push them to you know, possible educational and training and certificate opportunities. You know, someone mentioned in the forum this morning that the people who are going to sort of be left to do this work are the people who are still passionate about it and who have the mission to do this work. And and those individuals, we want to we want to grab them first because they don't put themselves up to be bid out to corporations. They really want to do community work. And that's where we need them. But we have to respect them with the wage. We have to respect them with the position we have to respect them with the opportunity for advancement. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this is such a great conversation. I know we went over time. Mm -hmm. I, I was just uh, completely, um, it, it was just just so engaging and so um, spot on. I actually, you know, was taking lots of notes because the way in which you you um, you describe it and say it is just, um, just really excellent. And it, uh, um, I think that you are laying out exactly uh, where we need to flow from um, community to um, treatment, to policy, to system change. It's just a, a really uh, clear um, and so aligned with tech, 100% aligned with tech. So um, absolutely, uh, Reggie Banks, you are a tech champion. <laughs> And um, I am uh, just thank you so much for being here today, for your time, for you, all of the work thank that you do. Thank you so much. I mean, I, again, I, I just want to tip my hat to you. This is the work that, you know, you know we're small, mid-sized providers and, and, and a provider, and we, we are out here. I think that this is a, an excellent time for us to be creative with these problems that we have. Uh, and sometimes you have to step away from the problem and begin to, to work this problem. And, and as long as you're passionate about it, the answers and will come. Uh, we can't do this without DBH. Uh, we, we, we can't do this. We've, we've been tied to, to your, um, um, your DEI steering committee. We, we participated in the healing spaces our staff have. Um, and so those things that we 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 have and that we participate on allow us to be creative and we're, we've scheduled the trigger film which is we we're expecting about a hundred and some people to come to the community event so these these are things that we know we have to do to make it easier to do our job uh but it also makes it easier for us to sit down and think about how to be creative uh with all of the overwhelming issues that we we see we see the problems we know that the problems are there so we are going to have to find a way to be creative and solve those problems. And, and, and these many efforts that you have with your department makes it easier for us to begin to think outside the box. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really excellent um, community conversation tech talk today. And I want to just thank all of you who are watching the DBH IDS Commission, tech talk community conversations. And we will 
convene again in July when another guest will help us learn more about the important work that our organization does and that their organization does and that we do together when we partner to address trauma, achieve equity, and engage community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.